Hello, my name is Harold Furch Scott Roth, and I'd like to welcome you here to the Hudson Institute Center for the Economics of the Internet. We're very pleased to welcome back to the Hudson Institute, Maureen Olhausen, former commissioner of the Federal Trade Commission and former acting chair of the Federal Trade Commission. Commissioner Olhausen is currently at the law firm of Baker Botts, where she chairs the, uh, uh, the uh, competition practice, and I assume as well, the practice on privacy. There are a few topics that animate the imagination of the American public more than competition and privacy. There's a recent report from the House Judiciary Committee about competition in, uh, in high tech, and uh, there are lots of issues surrounding competition in high tech that have, are widely discussed today. And privacy is a topic that all Americans uh, seem to be concerned about. Uh, every opinion poll uh, puts American concerns about privacy among their highest concerns in their day-to-day -day lives. Joining us today is Commissioner Olhausen, one of the world's leading experts uh, both on privacy and on competition, and in my view, probably the leading expert on the intersection of privacy and competition. She'll be discussing the intersection of competition and privacy for us so that we'll better understand both what is happening today and what will be happening in the future. Commissioner Rollhausen. Well, thank you, Harold. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for hosting me and for the Hudson Institute for having me. Uh, these are very um, hot topics these days. Uh, and uh, antitrust and privacy and the use of data have certainly uh, become very common, you know, points of discussion in antitrust analysis and um, in congressional proceedings. Um, and I think they need a little bit of unpacking, however, to understand where uh, where they're intersecting, where they're colliding, and what will be the best uh, way to think about these things to make sure we can still have good protections, privacy protections for consumers, as well as the dynamic competition, particularly in online markets that we have enjoyed. Um, so I'm going to um, uh, give a presentation that is based on um, an article I wrote earlier last year called Privacy and Competition, Friends, Foes, or Frenemies. The idea there is, you know, sometimes they seem to have uh, consistent goals, sometimes they have conflicting goals, uh, and, and I think the challenge is to figure out sort of where, where they go from there. Uh, that's just my background slide. So I'll just start with a little uh, preview of what I'll be covering and the current landscape. So, so what is privacy law? Um, it tries to help individuals assert control over their personal data. Um, and I think we think about that, you know, I share data uh, for a certain purpose. Uh, I wanna be sure that purpose is fulfilled. Um, I, you know, my data might then be shared with others and used to advertise to me or to create new products. And, you know, that can be very beneficial, but I don't want my data being used in a way that may harm me or a way I don't, you know, that's unexpected. And that's sort of been the basis of U.S. privacy law. Um, now, competition law, right, competition law is about how companies compete with each other. Uh, and competition law, the way it is looked at privacy and data issues is, is very different. Uh, it looks as data as a possible input to new products as a way to compete. Um, and consumer data uh, may be kind of a, a unique subset of data, of you know, different types of data, because there's always commercial data, there's you know, all, all kinds of, when you start opening the door to data, there's quite a lot of topics uh, that fall under data, but I think today we're really talking about data about consumers. Um, so there's a, a lot of debate about this and um, it's complex and there's potentially con contradictory goals of privacy and competition law and it creates strategic uncertainty for, for companies and for regulators. Uh, one of the things that we're seeing is heightened scrutiny for mergers uh, and also for conduct by large data rich companies. Um, so that's just kind of laying, setting the table there for, for some of these issues. So as we've mentioned, privacy and competition have become this very hot, hot topic. Um, previously, so I wrote an article about this uh, back in, uh, had published in 2015 about the, you know, kind of 
uh, how to deal with privacy and competition and data as a competitive issue. Uh, and back then, I think it was seen as a little bit of, okay, you know, why are you talking about this? And, you know, <laughs> these things are separate. You know, you're, you're kind of confusing us. Uh, but <laughs> fast forward to now, and we're really uh, kind of seeing this debate get more and more strident. Um, the Economist famously said the world's most valuable resource is no longer oil, but data. That has driven a lot of debate around that. I don't actually think that that analogy is correct. Uh, there's a lot of differences between oil <laughs> and data, such as when I use a barrel of oil, uh, my competitor can't use that same barrel. Uh, but, uh, you know, information about a consumer I can use, you know, my the person across the street can use. It's, you know, non-rivalrous. It doesn't get used up. Uh, it can become stale more quickly than, say, a barrel of oil can. So those are... I think uh, some, some of the, the questions that really need to figure into a competitive analysis and this kind of facile um, uh, comparison to oil, I, I really don't think is accurate, but it has certainly uh, caught a lot of people's attention. So I'll first talk about developments on the privacy front. Um, uh, many of you, I'm sure by now, are familiar with the European General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, uh, which went into effect in 2018. Uh, and this is a, has a very broad application of consumer privacy um, protections, and it applies to all personal data, which is defined as information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person. So it's not just your name and your social security number, um, your, you know, your address or, or, th or things like that. It's things that then also could be identifiable to a person. So perhaps an IP address or some other um, identifier. Um, it uh, now applies outside the territory of the EU to effectively cover any business doing business in the EU or holding data of EU persons. So if, uh, one of the uh, big areas of um, compliance work in the FT, uh, in, sorry, in the US in the privacy space in the past few years is getting uh, US companies compliant with GDPR to the extent that they are holding data of EU persons or doing business there. Um, so the way GDPR works, it limits data collection, processing, and retention. Um, you can process data, which means, you know, use it, uh, analyze it, and use it for the particular person uh, with the, that data subject's consent uh, or to perform a contract, right? So someone, you know, needs you to whatever, you know, uh, paint their house or, you know, provide that service. And so you, you need the data for the contract or for what's called a legitimate interest. Um, and that still needs some real definition, um, what a legitimate interest is. So I think a lot of companies have tried to rely more on consent rather than um, trying to discern what the regulators meant by a legitimate interest. Um, so the entity that, that controls the personal data, so the data controller, is responsible for and must demonstrate compliance. And penalties for non-compliance are potentially massive. Um, it may be the greater of 20 million pounds, uh, euros, excuse me, or 4% of annual worldwide turnover. So even though this is a European law, it, it can have a, uh, as I said, it has an extraterritorial territorial effect, and it can also use, you know, world, uh, you know, revenue to, to calculate it, its fines. Now, what about data sharing under GDPR? Oh, I mentioned this idea of a legitimate interest. So you don't need to get additional consent from the data subject if you are using his or her data for a legitimate interest. But that's a big term, and what does it mean? Can di direct marketing be a legitimate interest? So you think about how common it is that when you go uh, and you be, say you, um, you, know, you buy golf clubs, uh, and then you start to get advertising for golf resorts or for tubes or for, you know, what, what have you. Um, that kind of advertising is, uh, you know, often because that information about your purchase was shared. Uh, and in the U.S., 
Uh, we have things called data brokers, and they have them in other places too. Uh, and they create, they collect consumer data from a variety of sources, and they create profiles about consumers, right? So my golf example, or the, you know, uh, a, a parent with small children, or, you know, people at different phases of their life, uh, advertisers may want to advertise different products to them. And, and they want their advertising to be targeted and to be useful. Uh, reportedly, John Wanamaker, a big retailer, many years ago said, you know, I know, uh, you know, half of my advertising is wasted. My problem is I don't know which half. So having more detailed information about the population that you're advertising to can make that um, those ads more useful to those people uh, and more, uh, uh, you know, useful for the for the retailer or whoever is, you know, whoever is uh, advertising that product. But you to do this, you need access to data that's acquired by others. And one of the questions under GDPR is, is this part of a legitimate interest? Is this kind of, you know, advertising uh, permitted under this? Now, in the US, uh, while I was at the FTC, we issued a data broker report in May 2014 that talked about the risks and benefits. So we talked about it very much in those terms. There are definitely some consumer risks. Um, your data may be stored indefinitely. And, you know, is that, is that, you know, useful is does that create undue risk if somebody goes in and, and you know gets that data even once the purpose for which the data was collected has been fulfilled? Um, can data be used to discriminate against people? Um, can it be used in ways that cause undue harm to consumers that they're they're unaware of and they haven't agreed to? So those are some of the concerns that were raised in the in the uh, the FTC's data broker report. But on the other hand. The FTC recognized there are definitely some consumer and competition benefits, and noting that consumers benefit from increased and innovative products, uh, product offerings fueled by increased competition, and from small businesses that are able to connect with consumers that they may not otherwise have been able to reach. And that's a really key issue here uh, to, to understand this having this type of information more, uh, more available allows companies who don't necessarily have a lot of data about consumers because they're not a big platform to come in and to compete in the market. Um, it reduces an entry barrier by allowing them to also better target their advertising, better target, target their products. So, so to, to show how interrelated data and data privacy and competition can be. So one of the other things that GDPR had is this uh, requirement of data portability. It, the idea is to give people greater control over their data. Um, so it does this through providing them certain consumer rights, that they can ask the data controller to give them the data that they have about the, the data subject. Um, and also they can require and ask the data controller to transmit that data to another entity. So think about, you know, I've created a big, um, you know, a lot of information, specialization, things about me, say through, you know, through one, uh, through one service, uh, but now I want to use another service. I don't want to have to do that all over again. I just want to say, please transfer, you know, my collection of photos or my contact list or, or what have you to that other entity. So that's one of the things that GDPR is doing. And the idea is that it could also, so it benefits consumers, but also could enhance competition because it makes it easier for users, customers, consumers to switch between competing competing companies. You're not as locked in to saying, well, I've invested all this time and energy in creating you know, this uh, a specialized you know, library of information about me here, and I don't wanna have to start that all over again with a new provider. If I can just say, you know, transfer it over, then that helps me um, choose between them, and of course that sharp sharpens competition. So that's the European approach to data privacy law. Uh, we also have US privacy law. People often think that we don't, but we do. Um, and we have specialized privacy law. I'm not really gonna talk about that, but you're all familiar with HIPAA and you know, Gramm-Leach-Bliley, you know, financial privacy and health privacy. But for general consumer data, uh, it's the US Federal Trade Commission where I was a, a commissioner and acting chairman uh, that asserts 
a general US privacy oversight. And it does it through its basic statutory authority, which is uh, Section 5 of the FTC Act that prohibits unfair or deceptive acts or practices. So the FTC using this very general authority has brought hundreds of privacy enforcement cases. Uh, when the FTC first started out doing this uh, for, in the online space, it really was looking at whether a company in its privacy policy made a promise about how it would collect or use or share or safeguard consumer data. Uh, and if the company didn't fulfill that promise, then the FTC can bring a deception enforcement case. You made a promise to a consumer, you didn't keep that promise, you violated Section 5 of the FTC Act. And the, the agency used that quite um, dynamically, really going back, the first online privacy case uh, was called GeoCities, uh, and that was in, in the late 90s. And it was that kind of straightforward, you made a promise in your uh, privacy uh, statement, uh, uh, privacy policy statement, and you didn't adhere to it. The other, so so uses of data, right, are, um, uh, you know, subject to these privacy promises. But there's also issues where there's not a promise, but there's a use of data that's harmful to consumers. Um, and that could fall under the FTC's unfairness authority, where there, you don't need to make a promise, but if you ga engage uh, in an act or practice that is uh, likely to cause um, you know, a substantial injury to a consumer that the consumer can't reasonably avoid, and that's not outweighed by countervailing benefits to consumers or competition, that could be uh, an FTC violation under unfairness. And so we've seen that with things like um, in installing um, spyware on people's um, computers, right? There was no promise uh, but uh, that we, they wouldn't install spyware, but they, you know, entities were using it, companies were using it in ways that, um, you know, were, were unfair and caused um, substantial harm to consumers. So that's kind of the, the, the FTC approach. Um, and uh, as I mentioned in unfairness, it actually has a competition uh, factor at consider, considered into it. So it's, it's been kind of a useful um, idea, you know, like kind of going back to the data broker and advertising example, is there a benefit to competition by allowing um, certain data to be used for advertising we would generally say yes, but you know, then kind of way is there some other, um, you know, does it cause some other harm to consumers? But there is now, um, so that's me testifying, uh, <laughs> and I actually testified about two weeks ago too on the same same law. So given GDPR, and people are probably also aware that California passed a, a Consumer Privacy Act there's a question of whether the US needs an overarching federal privacy law um, to supplement and give more details than the FTC general unfairness and deception authority. And there's a lot of discussion about that. And interestingly, in the provisions of that bill, that is, uh, so there's two competing bills now before the Senate Commerce Committee, one by Senator Wicker, one by Senator Cantwell, uh, that has a lot of uh, detailed provisions about privacy. But one thing that both bills have is this idea of data portability. The idea that consumers should be able to say, what data do you have about me? And I want you to share it uh, with another, uh, you know, another provider. So some of these concepts that we see in GDPR, we're starting to consider whether they should be in, in US law. Uh, so I think the question is, what does that mean for competition, right? And how does current U.S. competition law, antitrust law, look at data about or created by consumers? Um, so certainly they see it as data as an asset, and as I already discussed, how it allows for more precisely targeted advertisements. Uh, so that that's a use, you know, can be a useful thing. Data can also be an input into another product, not just an advertising product. Um, so we see data, for example, uh, the app Waze, right? Um, it gives dynamic trip directions based on changing traffic conditions. And it does this because it is collecting data, real-time data from users about where their phones are, how fast they're going, what routes they're on. Um, and so this data about you know, individual drivers 
actually helps create uh, this product and the functionality of that product. Now, we, we talk a lot about, you know, data collected online through big platforms and things like that, but there's really a long history of consumer type of, or information about consumers being treated under the antitrust laws. So common examples are residential real estate records. There's actually been a, a fair amount of merger activity in that space uh, for title plans that, um, that uh, collect and, and um, compile real, residential real estate records for doing um, title searches. Uh, and the FTC actually uh, challenged a merger recently that said, no, you're, you've got, you're, you're, you know, you're getting uh, too much market power. Uh, uh, in, in these kinds of records, but those are records about individual, you know, consumers. Um, consumer credit data is also another um, common example in antitrust. It's a specialized data set. It's about consumers, about their individual behavior and their credit worthiness. So the idea of, you know, consumer information uh, being part of an antitrust analysis really isn't anything new. Um, so some more recent examples. So, so the question is also about what about data uh, involving online platforms and consumer data where consumers are creating data on the platform, creating, you know, um, created uh, consumer generated things like um, you know, consumer generated online reviews and ratings. So the Department of Justice challenged a merger between Bazaar Voice and Power Reviews uh, in 2013, uh, the merger had already been um, completed. It was a smaller merger and the agency challenged it later. And what they said was this merger of platforms for consumer generated online reviews and ratings uh, was going to reduce, well, was reducing competition, right? So that there had been competition between these two entities in having this platform for consumer generated online reviews is an important form of competition, right? It can, consumer shopping online or even offline often look at, you know, online reviews uh, to, to guide their purchases. Um, and that this um, merger created, you know, uh, reduced competition and that there were barriers to entry. It wasn't an easy market, but oh, well, anyone else could come in. And so the remedy that the uh, DOJ, well, the court imposed was that they had to divest these overlapping assets. And that's a very traditional antitrust merger kind, kind of remedy. Um, there's other cases uh, uh, using examples of data sharing as a remedy. So, so you know, in the previous case, I mentioned the, um, the idea, well, you just, you know, you, you undo, you know, unscramble the eggs, you, you know, you, you make the, yeah, the assets separate. Uh, but what about this question that's being driven about as um, by the debate was, well, rather than saying you can't merge, the, the, the remedy, antitrust remedy, is that you're going to have to share the data that you have about consumers, that that is going to be the, um, the way to address the competitive issues. Um, so we've actually seen this in a few, in a few cases, um, the Cox Automotive dealer track case, um, and it required Cox, the defendant there, to share vehicle service data with its competitor. Um, I mentioned the FTC title plan cases before they blocked the merger. In these previous ones, there were these series of mergers of databases of public real estate records. Um, and the FTC allowed the mergers, but required the merge companies to sell a copy of the title plant database. So essentially share the, share the data as, as a remedy. So, um, so again, you know, in particular examples, there have been um, antitrust remedies that require data sharing. But that's only under very limited conditions that data sharing is considered a remedy in US antitrust law. So as I already mentioned, it's to uh, address overlaps and specialized data that's hard to obtain. So the real estate title plan is a good example. That's publicly available data, but you have to go into the courthouse and you have to record it and, you know, it, it's, it's time consuming. Um, other types of data sets are, uh, you know, uh, like consumer reports and, and things like that. They are also specialized. They're not widely available kinds of data. You can't just go into a data broker and collect them. Uh, one of the other questions are, are the data assets necessary to compete? 
right? Or not just like it would be good to have, it would give, you know, a competitor a boost, but is it absolutely necessary? And then in a very traditional antitrust way, because sometimes people forget about this, you need to have a highly concentrated market post acquisition, where you have to say there is like, you know, market power here, it's highly concentrated, um, and not just that, well, wouldn't it be nice, or, you know, there's, you know, some kind of, um, you know, essential facility idea, of like, well, it's really an important thing, so everybody should have it. Um, it really has to be up till now in this idea that, well, it is because there's going to be a competitive market, an anti-competitive market structure or, or problem or you have a highly concentrated market such that we need this remedy to protect and preserve competition. So all of this debate, which has been going on, uh, you know, for uh, a while has really gotten supercharged as we have this, you know, increased reliance on technology across the board, right? So for now for work, for social life, for family, for consumer services, we've seen this whole move to online. Uh, and obviously COVID-19 has really accelerated that. Uh, and with that, even preceding COVID-19, um, but I think uh, the pandemic has certainly accelerated it, there's been this question about, okay, well, what about big tech platforms and the data that they're collecting and their ability to use it so effectively um, for their services and to um, you know, be really strong competitors. Um, and as part of this, there have been new calls for forced data sharing. So this first one, this first quote um, from 2018 is, this I, you know, George, Sor uh, George Soros saying these giant IT companies are near monopoly distributors, so they should be treated like public utilities, right? Like the, you know, the, uh, you know, old phone <laughs> company or, or really, I mean, that was, that was a, a private company, but, but more like, you know, your electricity or your water or sewer. And they should have more stringent regulations. Um, and there should be op open access to their data. Um, there was a case called HiQ Labs versus LinkedIn. It has since had many permutations up and down, but the court found a likelihood of success on a claim that LinkedIn, so we all know LinkedIn, the networking, professional networking site, should be forced to share data about individual LinkedIn users with competitors even if LinkedIn had said to users individually, we won't use it this way. The idea was this competitor to LinkedIn said, well, I need to have access to that data to compete. And the court said, well, that might be a legitimate antitrust uh, reason and that you can't, LinkedIn couldn't stop them from scraping this data, even though it violated what LinkedIn had promised its users. Uh, and then we've seen this very much in Europe that forced sharing of data may be a worthwhile remedy to address data monopolization by large tech companies. And again, they're talking about data about individual consumers, not, not other you know, type, types of data. I think we're all aware that there are multiple investigations of tech companies underway. The FTC you know, has a technology task force and now it's an enforcement division. There's constantly rumors about uh, enforcement against uh, you know, companies, uh, Google, uh, you know, DOJ um, announced a review of online platforms. Um, the congressional investigation uh, of, uh, of the companies you know, we have this quote, I have this quote from uh, Chairman Cicilline, uh, our founders would not bow before a king, nor should we bow before the emperors of the online economy. Um, and so there's this just intense focus right now on the big online players and data collection and use about individuals is really a key, a key part of that. Um, there was uh, this great political theater in July where they, the committee grilled uh, the, the tech platform CEOs, went on quite, quite a long time, asked them all kinds of questions, very, you know, uh, I would say a very um, uh, searching, uh, <laughs> somewhat hostile, uh, you know, uh, set, set of questions. Um, and then just recently, the House Judiciary Committee Majority Staff Report on Antitrust Reform was released. Uh, it's a very wide ranging report. It's hundreds of pages long. I'll just focus on the privacy and competition issues here. 
uh, the report asserts platform companies collect too much user information and they say this is a sign of their market power, right? So that uh, they are theoretically, this would be, their, you know, uh, the assertion is, is consumers wouldn't otherwise share this information, but they have to because these companies have, you know, market power. Um, it argues that the collection of consumer data creates barriers to entry for competitors. Uh, that, um, you know, if a, a big player is able to continue to improve its product, continue to draw customers to it because it has this data. And so that data is kind of like feeds into this cycle of, you know, a better product, more improved. So it will attract more consumers and that that is a barrier to entry for competitors. And its recommendation is that Congress require data interoperability and portability to lower barriers to entry and to reduce consumer switching costs. So this is a little bit like what we heard in privacy law and GDPR. But one of the things that I actually didn't put it on this slide is it is also recommending a, um, a wider acceptance of what's called the essential facilities doctrine, which has never been accepted in US antitrust law. But the idea of that is if you as a competitor have created an asset that is so key to um, competition that other competitors, you should be forced to share it with other competitors. So this started out with the idea of like a train a bridge built over the Mississippi. Um, there are some other, you know, permutations of it. There has been used to uh, you know, outside the US to try to force companies to share their intellectual property rights. Uh, now, perhaps data. I mean, it's kind of, um, you know, once you let that um, doctrine into full flower, it's a very easy step to say, well, you know, almost anything is really essential to competing. So you have to, so you have to share it. So just sum up here that, you know, privacy and competition really have a complicated relationship. So the foundation of privacy law is the concern that consumer data is just too widely available and that this leads to a loss of consumer control over their data. And then the remedy is to limit collection and to restrict sharing absent consumer instruction. Um, and so the results of that are a reduced collection of data and more barriers to entry, right? Because you can't share it, somebody can't get it from a data broker, um, so the company who collected it can, can hold on to it more unless the consumer says to share it. So then you look at competition law and there's this concern about a lack of access to data creating barriers to entry. And then the remedy is forced data sharing where data is difficult or expensive to create. So it goes beyond the idea uh, on, from a competition point of view of just saying, well, consumer gets to decide, I want to share my data with this company or with that company. If once you start saying data is an essential facility that must be shared, that kind of takes it away from the customer, the consumer altogether. And it's just that, um, you know, this idea that we're gonna force the data to be shared. And that kind of goes back to that high Q LinkedIn case that I mentioned. And so the result there is less consumer control over, over data sharing. Um, so that is the, um, kind of the, <laughs> what, what's, what, what's going on uh, in privacy and competition, and again, how they are um, uh, meshing or not meshing uh, too well these days. Well, thank you very much. Uh, that was an extraordinarily clear presentation. Uh, you covered a lot of ground, uh, and yet I, I think we are all uh, the wiser for your presentation. Um, I'm going to ask a few questions uh, to, to just follow up on a few points. You mentioned that there are a couple of uh, bills before the Senate Commerce Committee, and I suspect there may be some in the House. Uh, there have been efforts for federal privacy law for uh, quite some time. Could you give us your assessment of where the different bills are and what the likelihood of something passing in, in let's say, the next Congress, uh, how that looks right now? Yeah, so, so over time, there have been various attempts, often data security laws, got a, bills got a little farther than privacy laws. Um, but now that we have GDPR, 
which as I said is, you know, kind of driving a lot of, um, you know, uh, changes uh, and uh, questions about where sh would, should we be going. And, and one of the things to mention, I didn't mention my slides, regarding GDPR is it actually uh, ended up uh, having measurable effects in um, pushing some smaller competitors out of the market because it was just so onerous to comply with um, and the risks were so high. Um, so given GDPR, now you have California with its privacy law, which is, uh, you know, because it, it has to do with, you know, California, you know, it's a big part of our economy and consumers, you know, using the internet can really be based anywhere. Um, so I think it, th those two th things have really pushed the idea of it now is finally the time to have a uniform federal privacy law has really kind of pushed that uh, towards a lot more serious engagement. So we, so in the Senate Commerce Committee, um, there are two bills right now, as I said, one um, from Senator Cantwell, one from Senator Wicker, that have a lot of um, provisions in them and they would give uh, the FTC additional authority. Uh, there would be additional obligations on companies to give consumers uh, control over their data, insight into what they have, uh, portability, uh, impose on companies uh, greater obligations uh, for, you know, um, administrative oversight of how they use data. Um, and um, so you see kind of a lot of concepts, some of GDPR, some of California, some of the you know, traditional FTC Act kind of coming together. It would give the FTC um, civil penalty authority, which it doesn't have now uh, for privacy violations. Uh, it would um, give the FTC some limited rulemaking to uh, you know, kind of flesh out some, some of the, the provisions. So, uh, so there's, a lot of, there's a lot of overlap in those bills. Um, there are two areas right now that, uh, which are kind of the sticking points. One is this question of preemption of state laws. So the FTC Act is very general. Right, and it doesn't unfair and deceptive acts or practices, and it doesn't preempt state laws. Uh, in you know, uh, on you know, there are a lot of little FTC acts, you know, uh, in in state laws. But the idea is, if we're going to have a uniform federal uh, privacy standard, right, because we have now essentially a national market, uh, then the having various state laws that are um, inconsistent or different or higher or lower or whatever um, tear, takes away from that consistency that we're trying to get for consumers and for businesses and for regulators. So there's this question of whether a, a federal privacy law would preempt the state laws. Now there's agreement um, that uh, the state AG should have a role. So if there is a federal privacy law, the state AG should be empowered to enforce it. Um, so if there's a state, you know, a, a problem that's a particularly focused in a state, um, the state AG can, can take action under it, but it has to be, uh, you know, a, uh, enforcing that federal law. And there's a model for this already, and that's the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, uh, which the FTC enforces. The FTC has limited rulemaking authority under it. The FTC can get civil penalties if people violate it. Uh, the state AGs can enforce it, and it preempts state laws. So that's a fairly good model. Uh, but, but some, um, for example, in the Senator Cantwell's bill, uh, it doesn't preempt the state laws. It would only preempt it if there was a direct conflict, like you couldn't comply with the federal law and the state, the state law. So there, there's that issue there, which is, well, regulatory complexity. Uh, and I mentioned GDPR and this issue that for bigger companies, entrenched companies, they were able to better absorb all the challenges here, and it kind of forced some smaller players out of the market. And if you have, you know, multiple state laws and a federal law on top of that, that creates quite a um, quite a thicket of federal regulation that I mean of privacy regulation that will make it hard for smaller players to um, to compete, and also doesn't create much consistency for consumers. Uh, because, you know, where did the transaction take place? Why so I'm, I'm from California, but I'm in New Jersey and I'm, you know, 
doing right. a transaction. It's going to be shipped to my house. Like, what, okay, where, 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 what law applies, right? So, so really, I mean, I think it would be, you know, I, I'm in favor of having a federal law uh, that, you know, a strong federal law that allows the AGs to enforce along with the FTC, but that creates one federal uniform standard rather than having, um, you know, every state then come in with, with, with its own, because I think that's just better for competition, better for consumers, um, and uh, just, you know, will overall be better for the economy. But that's one of the sticking points because um, some people feel like, well, you're taking something away, you're taking protection away. Um, so, so as for the, um, the ability to get this over the finish line, uh, you know, there has been a sustained effort. Uh, we had this hearing uh, like about two weeks ago, um, which I think, you know, is just kind of really keeping the momentum up. Um, but these are, you know, the preemption. The other one is whether there should be a private right of action, um, which, you know, concerns about just it becoming kind of a, you know, uh, a tool for um, uh, you know, class action right. that don't really serve consumer interests. Uh, we've seen that in some of like the TCPA telephone consumer protection act kind of kinds of things. So, uh, but those are the two sticking points. Uh, I do think, you know, eventually we will have a bill because while we have California, California continues to change. Um, other states want to come online. Uh, I think you know, the FTC does need more ability, um, more authority. So I'm, I'm hopeful that maybe some of these last sticking points can get resolved, but you know, <laughs> the discussion continues. Uh, tell us a bit about how data portability has worked uh, in the EU with GDPR and how it might work in the United States. And, and how, does, how does a consumer know uh, which entities have information about them, because uh, there's a lot of information that can be collected uh, quite lawfully and legitimately without a consumer even knowing that the, it's being collected. Yeah, so that, that's a good that's a good question. So there are um, right now, I think data portability is a little more of a like it is exists. Um, I'm not sure it's had in, in Europe, I'm not sure it's had as much of an impact as people were hoping for, but it's still, it's still early, it's still early days. Um, yeah, but the, the question is, you know, there's not an obligation for companies to contact you and say, I have your data, right? You, you know, that sort of be on the consumer, but part of the issue is, so you can go to someone you know has your data and ask them, okay, you know, or look in their privacy policy, with whom have you shared it, right? So then you might be able to, fig to figure out who, who else might, might have it. Um, you know, one of the things uh, that often this is kind of based on is in the UK to try to open up um, competition in banking, they created this uh, portability of your banking information to try to, to spur more competition in, in banking. Um, and I think you know, ultimately it didn't have the uptake that they were, that they were hoping for. Um, so, so I think, you know, it's a little, I think it's a little bit of the chicken and an egg issue, right? How long does it take, uh, given this new ability for data portability to create, you know, companies that say, okay, that's, you know, that's how I'm going to now compete is this data is going to be ported, ported over to me. Um, there has to be a value to it for consumers for them to start doing it, right? So um, now in the US, um, I, you know, I think it would be the same, the same kind of thing um, where, you know, you would have this right to go and uh, under the bills and say, you know, what data do you have about me? I, you know, and, and then <clears throat> Also, how it's kept is also a very important kind of thing because companies sometimes keep data, um, right? They have their own particular um, analysis of it, right? And they don't necessarily want to share that because that's kind of their secret sauce, right? <laughs> they figure it, you know, they're better at targeting or, or creating products because they have their, their more um, capable of analyzing data. So that's another, that's another question. Like, is it, 
the data that comes back is, you know, Maureen Olhausen had, you know, three years of these kinds of purchases and, you know, you can ship that over to somebody else. Or is it, uh, you know, right now, this question of like inferred data, right? Because that's where some of the value is. It's not so much Maureen Olhausen had, you know, three years of buying, you know, golf clubs or golf balls or something, but like, okay, well, what does that mean? And what do we infer from that? And then does that inference need to be shared? That can have a really important competitive impact if that has to be, if that has to be shared. So I'm not sure that answered your question. <laughs> no. <laughs> And I think it, it ties into uh, my next question, which is about forced sharing of information. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think as an economist, that, that certainly makes me very nervous when the government starts uh, uh, forcing companies to share information. Um, uh, can you give us, uh, has that ever worked? <laughs> you know, like, what? <laughs> My assumption is it hasn't, um, and I, maybe I'm just worried too much about just the intellectual property rights of, of, of a lot of different types of information, but are there any successful cases where you, you could point to and sort of say, well, actually, it seems to have worked in this, this example? So, so one of the things people point to, but it's, very, it's a very limited example, is the idea that um, when we moved to having um, cell phones, right? And if a person wanted to um, switch cell phone carriers, um, they didn't want to change their number, right? So the FCC came up with a rule that you, you know, that number, number portability has to go with it. And then the data, you know, the FCC already had some rules about access to, um, uh, to user data, so that, but like that was that's in a very very narrow <laughs> kind of area. I mean, you know, generally uh, there are you know concerns that forced sharing leads to reduction. I mean, so you might in, you might have some static benefits, but you you'll lose the dynamic benefits, right? The idea that I'm going to have to invest in something that if it's successful, I have to share with my competitors, where if it's not successful, the losses are all mine, right? <laughs> I think, you know, has been a reason why force sharing has not been a feature of U.S. antitrust law. In fact, when you think about the IP, antitrust IP guidelines, I mean, they say, you know, um, that the idea that you would have to license your IP or your, tech, your technology, your, you know, your knowledge, right? Which data, you know, is is, the, is that um, is you know uh, very you know it's very disfavored, right? So, so I think the question here comes from the fact that well, it's it's data about consumers, and can the consumer have exercised that right to say I'm you know I want you you've got this data about me, I want you to share it with, you know, with, the, with this other entity. Um, it presents it in a little bit of a different light because, you know, it's the owner. The problem with the force sharing, one of the things that I wrote, you know, friends, foes, or frenemies about was this kind of obliteration of the consumer's control there. So when you think about that high LinkedIn case, consumers shared their data with LinkedIn and LinkedIn had given them a exactly. promise that they wouldn't allow the scraping. And the court said, we don't care if a competitor needs it, they're going to have access, you know, to it. And it just kind of cut out the consumer there. So that's, that's one of the areas where I, I'm very concerned because I think that, um, you know, kind of takes the, this push towards giving consumers more control and throws it out the window. That was the case I was specifically thinking about. It's just very chilling to think that a consumer can um, share information uh, on a highly confidential basis, uh, and then a court can come along and sort of say, well, that confidential information needs to be shared with a third party that you never had any agreement with. Uh, that seems very, very problematic. Um, yes, <laughs> agreed. <laughs> right. Um, 
let's let's go back to the uh, House Judiciary Committee report and uh, uh, you you did a great job of uh, summarizing uh, the the report. Um, where, where does that go? Uh, uh, do you see any legislation coming out of that, or is this just uh, a committee report describing the world as uh, as the House Judiciary Committee sees it, or or is there uh, any legislation that is possible to flow from it? Yeah, so a couple things on that. Interestingly, the report actually is from the majority committee staff. Right. So, <laughs> so it's even one step removed, right? But yeah. uh, Chairman Cicilline has said that there will be legislation coming out from this. Uh, now, what that legislation might look like, um, you know, to be determined. I mean, the report had lots of proposals for um, changing merger presumptions, for imposing uh, the essential facilities doctrine, for having uh, restrictions on the ability of um, <clears throat> um, platforms, you know, dominant platforms to um, to engage in uh, you know, acquisitions of smaller players. Um, lots of you know. Uh, you know proposals to revive, you know, Robinson Patman Act. So, so there's a lot of different uh, things that that may come out of that. Um, but I, and some of them, you know, I think were useful to give the enforcement agency more agencies more resources because they have not been given very many resources as our economy has grown. Uh, and as antitrust analysis has gotten more complex. Um, so, so the question though is, if there's legislation, how broad is it, right? Because right now, this has all been taking place basically in the context of talking about four companies. Um, but if these changes would be more widespread, right? And also then you have a question like, can you create a law that only applies to four companies? <laughs> um, and who are doing very different things, right? You know, one makes devices, one's a social, you know, and network, right. one's a search engine, you know, uh, the one's a retailer, <laughs> um, so uh, so I so I think um, you know it's possible there may be legislation to change merger review standards to change uh, the Clayton Act, um, but um, for some of these broader things, um, you know, I, it would be interesting to see kind of how we would achieve that through through legislation, and then would it, you know. Would there be pushback because as more industries realize they could be caught up in this because what's a tech platform that's a dominant player? I mean, there's lots of definitional issues. Um, I mean, certainly it's a it's a you know a call to arms, right? <laughs> um, and uh, whether that gets taken up in particular legislation that takes a form that gets through the House, that gets through the Senate, that gets you know approved by uh, the administration. Or the, a long, a long process. If, if it if it results in particular legislation at all. Well, I think I could go on all day asking uh, questions. This has been a, a, a just a wonderful presentation. Uh, but uh, I, I know that you have a busy schedule, and I want to uh, let you return. I want to thank you so much on behalf of. Hudson Institute and the Center for the Economics of the Internet. And we look forward to having you back again soon uh, to inform us again. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's my pleasure. <laughs>